And the recording has started. Go ahead, David. At the meeting of the Florida Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights shall come to order. Today is Friday, April 29th, 2022, and it is 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, I'm David Massat. I'm, I'm here um, because your chair, Nadine Smith, was not able to be present today. Uh, so under FACA, the staff director, the head of the agency, uh, has delegated the authority of the chair at a meeting to me and then to your DFO, Melissa Winerowski, once she becomes available. Um, so thank you for your patience as we kind of co-chair this meeting. Um, I would like to invite Liliana Schiller, the support specialist for the Florida Advisory Committee to assist with roll call. Um, committee members, if you are joining by phone, which I don't think anybody is, but if somebody is, um, please press star six to unmute yourself and star six to place yourself back on mute until I call on you during the question and answer session. Um, Liliana, go ahead. Thank you so much. So Chair Nadine Smith is excused. Warren Belmar. Present. Bradford Brown. Here. Thomas Newcomb High. Present. Charlene Taylor Hill. Here. Linda Kidwell. Michael Morley. Present. Brandon Wolf is excused. Victor Romano. And Tufik Zakaria. All right, that concludes roll. Thank you, Liliana. And also present our commission staff, Mallory Trachtenberg. And there may be members of the public who have joined in a listen only capacity until I invite them to share comments during the public comment period. American Sign Language and closed captions are available for today's briefing. To view the closed captions from a PC, click the CC icon in the lower left corner of your screen. The U.S. Commission on Civil Rights is an independent, bipartisan agency of the federal government charged with studying discrimination or denial of equal protection of the laws because of race, color, religion, sex, age, disability, or national origin, or in the administration of justice. In each of the 50 states and the District of Columbia and the U.S. territories, an advisory committee to the commission has been established, and they are made up of responsible persons who serve without compensation to advise the commission on relevant information concerning their respective geographic jurisdiction. Our purpose today is to hear testimony regarding voting rights in Florida. If speakers begin to veer away from the civil rights questions at hand to discuss possibly important but unrelated topics, I or Melissa will interrupt and ask them to refrain from doing so. Today's meeting is part of a series of meetings the committee is hosting on this topic. All meeting information is available in the Federal Register. Based on the information collected through testimony, our, the committee will draft a report to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights that will include findings and recommendations. The Commission will then forward those recommendations to the appropriate federal, state, and local entities. So now I will present the ground rules for today's meetings. Today's meeting. This is a public meeting open to the media and the general public. This meeting is being recorded for the public record. We have scheduled panelists who will be making presentations within the limited time available. After all the panelists, all two of them, have concluded their statements, committee members will engage in question and answer. The rules for the committee question and answer portion of the panel discussion are as follows. The question, the question and answer session is reserved for committee members only. The committee may ask questions of the entire panel or individual members of the panel after all panelists have had the opportunity to provide their prepared statements. Committee members must be recognized by the chair before asking any question of the participants. Once recognized by the chair to speak, it will take a moment for the recognized member to be unmuted within the WebEx platform, and they will then need to unmute themselves in order to speak. This can take a few moments to coordinate, and so we ask for your patience. In addition, because of the large number of members and short amount of time, each committee member will be limited to one question. 
The chair may return to ask if committee members have a follow-up question as time allows. To accommodate persons who are not on the agenda but wish to make statements, a public comment session will commence once the committee question and answer period concludes. At the appropriate time, when I indicate to do so or Melissa indicates to do so, anyone wishing to make a statement should press star three on their phone or use the raise hand function on their web browser through WebEx to request that their line be unmuted. They will then have the opportunity to unmute themselves in order to make a public comment. In order to ensure that all aspects of the issues are represented, knowledgeable persons with a wide variety of experience and viewpoints have been invited by the committee to share information. So some of the statements made today may be controversial. We want to ensure that all guests do not defame or degrade any person or any organization. I, or Melissa as chair, reserve the privilege to cut short any statements that defame, degrade, or do not pertain to the issue at hand. Any person or any organization that feels defamed or degraded by statements made in these proceedings may provide a public response during the open comment period. Alternatively, such persons or organizations can file written statements for inclusion in the proceedings. I urge all persons making presentations to be judicious in their statements and keep the civil rights topic at hand. The advisory committee appreciates the willingness of all participants to share their views and experiences with this committee. So at this time, I would like to invite our first panelist to begin. As a reminder, committee question and answer will commence until, not commence until after we've heard from all of our presenters today. So the first presenter today will be uh, Vice Dean Fernita Tolson whose bio is now on the WebEx screen. Uh, and uh, Vice Dean Tolson, please begin your remarks. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address this committee on the important implications of SB 90 for minority voters. I would yeah. like to use my brief time to put the law in historical context. Despite historic turnout in recent elections, the process of casting a ballot has been more difficult for minorities as compared to white voters for a long time. And this is true even as American democracy has evolved towards being more inclusive. Many of these difficulties predate the current wave of restrictions that Florida enacted in the wake of the 2020 election. For example, minorities have consistently faced longer wait times on election day for years. Prior to 2012, Florida had a significant number of mandatory early voting days, but these days were reduced from 14 to 8, putting further pressure on election day turnout and participation. For example, one study found that 201,000 Florida voters did not cast a ballot in 2012 because of long lines. Long lines resulted because Florida not only reduced the number of early voting days, but it also reduced the number of polling places open during early voting hours. Minorities who vote by mail are also more likely to have their ballots rejected. And this was true prior to the increase in vote by mail usage in the state in 2020. But 2020 was particularly notable because racial and ethnic minorities in Florida who voted by mail were over 60% more likely than white voters to have their ballots initially rejected. Florida is also notorious for the manner in which it purges voters. In multiple recent election cycles, black voters made up a disproportionate number of voters purged from the voting rolls, often erroneously. These voters have nonetheless opted to participate in the political process despite these difficulties. By waiting in line during the 2020 election cycle in some places for hours, um, by organizing on the ground to help increase turnout, these are the steps that minority voters took in order to make sure that their vo voices were heard. In the wake of the 2020 election cycle, these efforts were rewarded with, not surprisingly, more restrictions. And I say not surprisingly because Florida has tried to curb the political power of minority communities for over a century. And its efforts, although evolving, have continued in a pretty much unbroken line since the end of Reconstruction. During the 1890s and since, Florida has enacted voting laws to not only disenfranchise minority voters, but also to create a cohesive white majority that will have difficulty forming coalitions with minority voters. White voters aligned with the then dominant Democratic Party in the state were able to secure and main maintain power by devising an election system that had two dominant features. First, Florida restricted its electorate through facially discriminatory practices coupled with violence, intimidation, and voter fraud that purged the electorate of minority voters 
and also eliminated poor white voters who supported third parties, leaving a predominantly white one-party system in place. Second, to maintain this white electorate, Florida used facially neutral laws, such as poll taxes, annual registration requirements, and eight box laws, which is a law that uh, requires voters, many of whom were illiterate at the time, they were forced to fill out separate ballots for each race and then put them in a corresponding box or their vote would not count. These efforts ensured that participation among minorities dropped precipitate, precipitously. Um, these efforts were also coupled with extensive gerrymandering to further diminish the political power of minority groups. Because the law has restricted the ability of states to rely on facially discriminatory practices, Florida, like other states, has increased its reliance on facially race-neutral laws to disenfranchise minority voters. Diving deeper into this category, it is clear that most states, including Florida, have generally taken a three-tier approach to suppressing the vote through facially race-neutral means. So first, they changed their voter registration laws to eliminate potential voters at the outset. Second, they may adopt or change voting devices to eliminate registered voters at the participation stage. Finally, they may purge voters ahead of the next election cycle. Following this pattern, SB 90 disenfranchises voters through facially race neutral means that have been enacted in Florida in the past, similar to laws enacted in Florida in the past, excuse me. So SB 90 seeks to curb the high turnout that the state experienced in the 2020 election by making it more difficult to register to vote. So SB 90 makes it difficult for voters to request an absentee ballot by requiring any voter seeking to vote by mail to provide their Florida driver's license number, a Florida identification card number, or the last four digits of their social security number. It also reduces the duration in which the ballot request is valid from two election cycles to one general election cycle, or from four years to two years. Among its provisions, SB 90 restricts the use of ballot drop boxes, it limits most access to these boxes to early voting hours, um, and it requires that all drop boxes be continuously monitored by the supervisor of elections. SB 90 also imposes significant burdens on the delivery of completed ballots. So the law prohibits the possession of more than two vote by mail ballots by anyone other than immediate relatives. It also substantially affects get out the vote efforts by third party organizations, and it makes these efforts more difficult by imposing new requirements on these organizations. Under SB 90, all completed registrations have to be delivered to the Division of Elections in the county in which the voter resides within 14 days of completion. Under the prior rule, these applications could be returned to any Division of Elections in the state. While it is difficult to know the impact of these laws on minority voters so far, these laws are expected to have a chilling effect on the voter registration efforts um, uh, for minority groups and also make it more difficult for voters to request mail-in ballots and send them in particularly through its limit on drop boxes. Um, and if one looks at the historical record, it is clear that SB 90 is designed to mimic the effects of the voter suppression laws of days past. By shortening the window in which vote by mail requests are valid, for example, SB 90's vote by mail requirement bears a remarkable resemblance to Florida's 1887 annual voter registration requirement because it forces voters to uh, fill out the requirements to, get a, to vote by mail more frequently than they otherwise would have. Of course, this leads to mistakes and errors by voters who may not be aware of this new requirement. In fact, the difficulty that individuals have with complying with SB 90, which requires voters to provide additional information from outside sources to verify their identity on the application, is not unlike the 19th century requirement that voters show up with registration certificate in hand on election day to cast a ballot. One of the key disenfranchising features of Southern registration laws were the specificity of the information required of the registrant. And in this way, SB 90 is no different from its predecessors. The hope in enacting the law is that some, 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 excuse me, that some subset of voters will either not have access to the information needed or will misplace required documentation so as to prevent them from registering to vote. In addition, some of the restrictions are designed to drive down turnout overall especially those restrictions making it more difficult for third party organizations to register voters. By way of comparison, the facially neutral voting restrictions in the state during the 1890s, so as mentioned, the poll tax, the annual registration requirement, and the eight box laws were designed to have, and indeed did have, a disenfranchising effect that the proponents of SB 90 hoped to replicate in some form. 
During the 1890s, African-American turnout dropped over 50 percentage points in four years because of these restrictions. The goal now is to pass similar restrictions that can also have a targeted impact among this demographic. In fact, a federal district court recently enjoined parts of SB 90. Finding this history pertinent in determining that the law violated the Voting Rights Act of 1965, as well as the 1st, 14th, and 15th Amendments through its limits on drop boxes and its limits on third party voter registration organizations. And looking at Florida, its history, and its response to the historic turnout in the 2020 election, a clear trend emerges. Florida will always seek to make voter registration difficult in the face of increased turnout and demographic change that threatens the majority party. While the changes to various methods of voting will depend upon the targeted demographics voting patterns, this is consistent with historical efforts to suppress the vote. So consistent with this insight, in 2020, there was a shift nationwide in vote by mail in which it was disproportionately used by minority voters. This was also true in Florida, where there was a 100% increase in vote by mail by black voters between 2014 and 2020. Whereas the use of vote by mail by white voters did not change on a percentage basis over the same period. Black voters also disproportionately use drop boxes relative to white voters. Thus, it is no surprise that SB 90 specifically targets both practices. Consider this in light of the cuts to early voting in 2011, 2012 in the state. Black voters disproportionately used early voting relative to white voters in 2004 and 2008. So early voting was cut. The same was true of vote by mail in 2020. Increased use by minorities resulted in access being cut. The burdens that SB 90 imposes on third party voter registration organizations are also tied to the fact that these organizations disproportionately register minority voters. During 2020, about one in every 10 black and Latino voters registered through one of these organizations, whereas for white voters, the number was around one in every 50. In some, Florida is just like other states that have re recently enacted restrictive legislation, including Georgia and Texas, because the goal is to burden registration and restrict voting methods based on minority voting patterns. And it is likely that this trend will continue well into the future. Thank you, and I welcome your questions. Thank you so much, Vice Dean Tolson, for your remarks and for your research on this important topic. Um, the next presenter, and then we'll go to committee question and answer, will be uh, Supervisor of Elections, Joe Scott. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to come in and speak today. Um, for us, we have... Um, as a newly elected uh, supervisor of elections, these first couple of years of my tenure, I was elected in 2020, uh, basically at the same time as the um, 2020 election, which really changed the way that uh, election administration has been done, especially here in the state of Florida. With the 2020 election, when the, in the immediate aftermath of the election, our governor was very open about the fact that he felt that the election had gone very smoothly, that there weren't any major problems, any major problems to fix, that Florida was a model for the nation. And from what I have observed in my time now in, in this role is that there has been this constant discussion about, you know, uh, constant lies about what happened in the last election used to justify changes in the law and changes in the law that are now making it more difficult for people to register to vote, as well as more difficult for people to um, actually participate when it comes time to vote. So what we have actually seen um, in the last year and a half now is um, the way that the laws have changed and the way that it is practically impacting us as elections administrators is that we are having to expend more resources really in order to basically have the same level of um, access for the voters in our community as what we had before. Representing a large uh, county here in the state of Florida that is also a uh, majority minority county. It's a county that has a lot of working people who participate in vote. Um, the voters in my county are looking for more options. They're looking for 
the opportunity to vote before election day because chances are they're going to be at work all day on election day. So more and more of this community is moving towards uh, voting by mail as well as early voting options. And the way that the laws have changed over the past couple of, not just the past couple of years, but really even before that, um, was towards this effort to um, restrict, say, the uh, from a budgetary standpoint, our ability to offer the full range of options. So, you know, we continue in Broward County because of the um, sort of the requirements that come from our community. You know, like I said, because of the fact that our community really wants people to vote by mail and vote early, people people want that here. So even though the state might res restrict, um, make it more difficult for us to do it, we end up expending more resources on those things. And we live in a county with lots of other problems, lots of other issues. It would um, it would be better if those tax dollars could be used. For other programs, uh, for healthcare, for education, for other social programs in the community, rather than using those um, dollars for the escalating costs of elections that are primarily coming from the fact that we're being required to do more. So let me give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. Uh, primarily in reference to the way we offer our drop boxes. So in a big county like ours, the way that the laws are based, the law, the way the law is written, we can only have our our drop box locations when there's not a, well, a we have we can have drop box locations during early voting. So if you limit early voting, then you're limiting the drop box locations as well. So the other alternative to early voting is that the drop boxes have to be at a permanent office of the supervisor. So the permanent office of the supervisor for us is currently two different locations, which is really just. Um, the reason we have two different locations now is really just has to do with the fact that the offices are in our government center. And then we have another warehouse location that's primarily used to store our voting equipment. So those two permanent offices were really the only two places where we had drop boxes. Now, what I did since I became supervisor last year, I opened up a bunch of branch offices that then would allow us to have multiple um, drop box locations around the county. So once I did this, Basically, this year with the new law, so after SB 90 passed, they came back in the following session and they passed SB 524. One of the things that happens with SB 524 is that they now require the branch offices to be open 40 hours a week from the hours of 9 to 5. So basically saying, and, and specifically, the branch offices have to be open for those hours if you want to have a drop box at that branch office. So saying, okay. You know, we, we, we came up with this plan of saying, okay, there has to be a permanent office of the supervisor in order for us to have a branch office. So in some cases, we're using county facilities. We're going to have our, our employees there, say, one day a week, so that, and we post these hours up and say, okay, we have a branch office now. So then the, the legislature comes back and changes the law and says, no, you can't just do it one day a week. It needs to be five days a week if you still want to have your drop box. Of course, that's the reason that the branch office exists in the first place is so that we can have the drop boxes there. That's the primary purpose. Most of our citizens are now um, doing a lot of the administrative, updating their records and things online, or they can do it over the phone. This, the, the primary purpose for the, for the branch offices, which is well understood, um, was so that there could be a drop off location, um, which in a way is absurd to begin with because we have multiple government facilities with excellent security that we could potentially just offer a drop box at the time that they needed. For example, um, you know, I would I would have probably 40 different locations for drop boxes if I could, but this requirement to staff those, you know, staff an office 40 hours a week from the hours of nine to five in order to have a drop box there then makes the cost much higher. If you combine that with the fact that there is also a $25,000 fine attached if um, the drop box is ever unstaffed. It just means that there has to be additional layers of, of um, bureaucracy put in place just to make sure that there's never, you know, never a problem, never a concern that, you, that somebody might have to step away and use the restroom briefly or something like that. Um, 
that we could end up having to pay that fine. So we have to do a lot of extra steps because of the way that the law was written, just to make sure, you know, that just to make sure that we're offering our citizens all the options that they have. Now, what would be the alternative to this is before SB 90 was passed, we actually used video surveillance to monitor our drop boxes. And we had the drop boxes in secure locations. We did use video monitoring. We had 24 hour um, security on the drop boxes by way of video monitoring, and we never had an issue. We never had anybody bother any of our drop boxes. So it just wasn't a, it wasn't a problem before. Now the security level was improved, but now the state is actually requiring a lot more administrative effort out of us. So really that's just one example, but there are others um, in terms of, you know, requiring people to request a vote by mail ballot um, after every election is um, a bit of a burden when you consider the fact that we do our list maintenance program, which says basically we have first class mail that's election mail. So our election mail, if it's returned to us, it can't be forwarded, right? So if it goes to an address and it gets returned, then we will basically cancel that vote by mail request. Um, so we already basically have a system in place that would allow us to cancel vote by mail requests for people who are no longer at an address or people who no longer wish to have a vote by mail. But with the new law put in place, we now have this huge administrative burden, which almost um, is almost reminiscent of the um, idea of making people register to vote every single year. If you want to vote by mail, you have to request it every single uh, cycle now. Um, so it's, you know, you can just see where it's almost like echoes of what happened in the past happening all over again. So just from you know my level as an administrator here and um, actually doing the on the ground work of trying to make these elections happen, I can see you know, what's happening and I can see why it's happening. I can see that these laws are being passed specifically to make it harder for people in Broward County uh, to participate, harder for people in Broward County to register to begin with by making it harder for third party organizations to, to operate and then harder for people to participate once they are registered to vote. Um, so this is a massive problem that we really do need action at the federal level in order to, in order to make it so that you know states cannot um, enact these type of laws, uh, restricting people's abilities to get registered and their abilities to participate in elections. And I'll take your questions. Great, thank you. At this time, we'd like to open the floor for committee members to ask questions. We'll go ahead and begin with uh, Warren Belmar. Warren, do you have any questions for the speakers? You may be muted. Would it be possible to ask a question of both panelists so that they both can answer? Sure, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, very helpful. Thank you for your participation. Uh, I, I did a little math and uh, identified some of the things that were expressed as being not only of concern, but having a uh, improper motivation. And one of them was the idea that uh, the state limited the time for requesting an absentee ballot from four years to two years, which means that it no longer allowed 1,460 days to ask for an absentee ballot. It now asks for 730 days is the limit that you have to ask for an absentee ballot. And you indicated in one of the comments that when an absentee ballot is sent out to someone and it is returned, you do not keep that person on the absentee ballot list and you delete them from the request for absentee ballot. But you didn't address whether you then delete them from the voter rolls themselves. And we did hear earlier by the first uh, witness uh, that the difficulties that, that came from that were designed to suppress the 
uh, voting rights of some segment of the population, and that it amounted to a purging of the voter rolls. Uh, do you think that removing people, or at least pursuing whether they're still residents of the district in which they're voting, or the precinct in which they're voting, is a suppression of voting rights of people? So, yeah, so to answer your question in terms of the, you know, they won't receive another vote by mail ballot. The other piece of that is that there is a process that we go through, which is our list maintenance process um, that would be triggered by them um, by getting a return mail from that person. So we do have uh, other steps that we take in terms of verifying before they would become inactive or ineligible to vote. Um, but it isn't something that would happen automatically. There are other steps that have to be taken before when you say removed from the voter rolls in Florida, we either move them to inactive or we move them to ineligible. And um, before we would make that, before we would do that, there are other steps that we would take as well. So in terms of the um, actual vote by mail ballot, we would actually try to contact the voter to see if they, you know, to make sure that they're aware of the fact that the ballot was returned to them, but we wouldn't necessarily make them an inactive voter immediately. There are other steps that we would take first. So as you take those steps, uh, would that not be, would you characterize that as suppression when you take those steps? I, I I'm not sure I would characterize it as suppression the way that, uh, I think that we are very careful in the way that we do it in my office. Um, so I so I would not characterize what we do in my office as, as being suppression. And I guess the last thing, just to tie it all together so I can understand the circumstances, uh, when you want to drop off a ballot in a drop box, you have requested an absentee ballot, if I understand it. And if there is not an absentee ballot drop box handy, uh, couldn't anyone during the period of early voting just drop it in the mail? They can, but there's been concerns there as well in terms of the mail service and the reliability of our mail service. So there's so a lot of people in our community prefer to use drop boxes. So they, you know, it's postage paid, so they can actually drop it in any mailbox and it'll come back to us. But people prefer the drop boxes. Well, we're talking about a racially motivated discriminatory practice. And you're telling me that the problem is that people would prefer to drop it in a drop box rather than a mailbox. That, and that I think probably that's... strikes me as rising to the level of a racially motivated discriminatory provision that applies to everyone. Well, no, I, I will. I think that there's some cultural differences, and I think sometimes that's recognized that um, that there are just different cultural practices. Um, in terms of some of the changes that happen in terms of uh, what people sometimes refer to as uh, ballot harvesting, that um, in some communities there's a, you know, definite, um, you know, this this um, tendency to do a collection, like at church and things like that. So you'll have these collections that happen, and then people will go and drop off everybody's ballot because they don't want to trust it to the postal service. So they have a, a distrust of institutions. Um, and, uh, I actually don't, I would love for, you know, Vice Dean Tolson to also, um, you know, I know you open this up to both, uh, to both panelists. So I think she'd probably be able to handle that part a little bit better than I can, but just from what I observe, you know, as in my role as an administrator here is that, you know, there are, you know, especially our minority communities, there's a mistrust of institutions. People will prefer to do things like say, have the church collect all the ballots and deliver it to the office because they know that their vote. Um, made it in and was counted that way. Um, so then let's make that 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 becomes illegal um, because it's a cultural practice for a certain community. Um, so it does to me, it definitely feels like it's a, a racial discrimination uh, measure the way that these laws are being changed. To me, it's, it's almost like crystal clear that it's like, who who's actually doing this? Who's actually using the drop boxes? Who does the, the community collection of, of ballots um, and things that go on sometimes? Um, it, it seems pretty clear that this is a, a racial issue. Dean Tolson, do you have anything to add? You're on mute. 
I'm sorry, I was muted. Apologies, um, uh, Commissioner Belmer. Uh, so I agree with Mr. Scott, but I would also point out that federal law doesn't require that the, the legislature or even the division of elections necessarily act with discriminatory intent, right? So it is enough here that the uh, the SB 90 uh, burdens uh, minorities disproportionate to um, white voters. Uh, as um, Mr. Scott pointed out, uh, black voters were more likely to use drop boxes. Um, and, and it is cultural to some extent rooted in a distrust of, uh, of its institutions, but, but more pointedly, the fact that the state legislature has targeted this particular voting method uh, to make it more burdensome, uh, and, and, it, and it could be because uh, minority voters uh, use it more than white voters, uh, but federal law doesn't require that showing be made necessarily. So the Voting Rights Act can be violated if the state um, imposes a law that has a discriminatory effect. Um, the 14th Amendment right to vote um, also um, uh, extends beyond discriminatory intent. Uh, so I just want to make that point in, in highlighting why these particular practices are still problematic. Well, it seems to me it would be more problematic in elections before 2020 when we didn't have any drop boxes. And now, if I understand what you're saying, it's easier for non minorities to use drop boxes under the new restrictions than it would be for minorities. And I no, don't I, know that. Uh, so, so, no, I'm saying that um, this particular practice burdens the voting rights of minority voters because minority voters uh, had a preference for the drop boxes, right? It's not necessarily that that white voters now have it easier with respect to using drop boxes uh, relative to, um, to to black voters. It's the fact that this particular practice has been targeted in a way that disproportionately affects voters of color. Um, and so under the Voting Rights Act, that's, that's problematic. Well, Mr. Moussad, I think I've spoken enough. Why don't we move on to the next member of the advisory committee? Great, thank you. And at this time, we'll go to Bradford Brown. Bradford Brown, do you have any questions? I have a question for Mr. Scott. Uh, are you familiar with what happened a couple of elections ago with mail ballot boxes, with mailed in ballots in Miami Dade? Um, like if you're referring to the, um, you know, the ballot harvesting issue, is that what you're referring to? No, I'm refer referring to the fact that photographs taken inside post office by post office workers sur surreptitiously, because that's not supposed to be done, uh, came out throughout the community showing boxes sitting in the post office full of uh, mail-in ballots that weren't getting to the post office. Yeah, okay. So yeah, that's what you're referring to. Um, yes, I'm aware of those issues happening. Matter of fact, we've had a similar issue happen more recently here in Broward County um, a year ago where we had a- And, and um, you realize obviously that Broward and, and Dade are very close and uh, there is obviously uh, that created a great deal of, of apprehension on the part of people wanting to mail in ballots, uh, particularly in the black community. The NAACP had a major press conference on it for the, uh, after when they were there. It was in all the press. So uh, I, I think very strictly uh, that anybody who was in south the south florida southern part of florida within that uh, was well aware of why people would be prefer be more confident in dropping a mail uh, ballot in a mail-in box in a drop box than in a post office box right the, the demand yeah it's clearly a greater demand for you know, the drop boxes here in South Florida, and that, that probably has a lot to do with it. Um, just in terms of the fact that there have been problems in the past, you know, we're working hard to improve those relationships and improve our procedures with the Postal Service to make sure that we limit how many ballots arrive late. Um, one of the problems is that here in the state of Florida, unlike many other places around the country, the ballot has to reach us by 7 p.m. on election night. If we were um, able to operate um, on, um, 
uh, postmark date instead of uh, instead of when it arrives here. You know that could help alleviate where some of the where um, a logistical issue in the post office then disenfranchises the voter. Right? We don't want the postal service to have that much power. You know, so we really should have it so that it's a postmark date. So if the person mails it and it's postmarked, you know, if we get it, you know, within say ten days after the election, you know, we can still count those ballots. But currently, that's not the way that the, uh, you know, the way the process works. And because of that, people do have concerns about sending their ballot through the mail. Would you say that the efforts that Broward makes to ensure that all of its citizens, no matter what their background, have access to vote is typical of your fellow uh, efforts throughout the state, or is Broward and perhaps somewhat unique in this effort, not only in your work, but in the work of several of your predecessors who made a major effort to uh, you know, make sure that the franchise was available? Uh, so I believe, especially in the current environment, that um, some of my colleagues around the state are, and I'm concerned for them about a potential primary challenge. Um, and as a result, I think that there is a high likelihood of a chilling effect happening on a lot of supervisors across the state in terms of providing, um, say, providing drop boxes, because especially in areas that are um, very conservative areas of Florida, the people don't want that option there because they've been told that there's something wrong with drop boxes or something wrong with vote by mail. So many of my colleagues, there, there is a bit of a chilling effect on their um, willingness to um, to promote those methods, promoting vote by mail and having drop boxes available. So, you, so yes, yeah, so Broward County will be much different uh, than many parts of Florida in that respect, in that we are continuing to drive, um, you know, adoption to vote by mail, and uh, we are continuing to commit the resources necessary to drop boxes because our community wants them, while many other communities in Florida do not. And since we are elected officials, we do have to uh, be in tune with, you know, what our communities are looking for from us. And I know my fellow supervisors feel the same way, you know, and, and pay the same attention to their communities as I pay to mine. Thank you. And I appreciate all the efforts that you are doing to ensure that everybody can vote. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And we'll move next to committee member Thomas Newcomb Hyde. Mr. Hyde, please go ahead. You are muted. Hear me now. Yes. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Please go ahead. I'd like to uh, uh, speak to Supervisor Scott. Supervisor Scott, uh, uh, Dean Tolson talked about the 14th Amendment right to vote. I don't see anywhere there's a 14th Amendment right to a box or drop box. And you seem to feel that this is the, this, the collect, correct solution to all these problems. There's no vote right to with drop box. You could vote early, you can vote on the day of the election, you can vote by mail. And for some reason you seem to think that people can't seem to get to the election to the precinct to vote. They go to Home Depot, they go to Publix, they go to CVS, McDonald's, and um, Burger King, but they can't somehow get to the election place to vote. Can you care a comment on that? Uh well, no, I uh, what I would say is that the the problem here is that the Vote by mail just gives people another option, right? So you have, um, we want to make sure that especially the people who are the hardest working people in our community have an opportunity to vote. So we have- Oh, who, who are the hardest who working? I don't know who the jobs. hardest working- Okay, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think you're on mute again. Sorry. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay, please go ahead. 
Am I going? Yeah, I was going to let you go. Since. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I I'm not quite sure. I understand that that, that Dean uh, Tolson wants to talk about the 14th Amendment and we need rights. But I don't think that black people have a, a prejudice against the post office. I go to the post office all the time. I see all kinds of people. They're not afraid to put their, their mail in, in, the, in the post office. They packages, mails, all kinds of things. Why is it so terrible to drop your, your, your ballot in the United States Postal Service? Well, I mean, so I, I, hear, I get the feedback, you know, so that's, that's the feedback that I hear. Um, you know, I hear it, especially from our local NAACP chapter and from a lot of other, you know, black people uh, and, you know, in my community. So, so it's direct, you know, I'm, I'm basing this off of what I'm hearing directly from my constituents. You know, so that's, so that's number oh, one is that I know that there is a preference for that. And it's also something that people have noticed in other jurisdictions as well. I've spoken with other supervisors in large cities on um, one major city that, um, that I spoke with the elections administrator there, they actually, in some cases, put the drop boxes right next to the blue post office mailboxes. A lot of people just prefer to that, that security of knowing that it's going straight to the supervisor and it, it won't get tied up in the, in the system. So people prefer the drop boxes. It's, um, you know, part of it, my thing, you know, I get what you're saying that, you know, it's not in the constitution that they have a right to the drop box, but it's, um, if it's what people prefer, if it's the way people would like to vote, you know, this is a democracy, right? We want, you know, if, if, if that's what the people prefer, why would we not offer that option to them? I don't, there's no, um, it doesn't seem to be a good reason to restrict people from an option that's very popular. Thank you so much. And we'll take follow up questions with the next round after all committee members have had the chance to comment. Um, <clears throat> thank you. We'll move next to Charlene Taylor Hill. Charlene, would you like to ask a question of speakers? Yes, thank you. Thanks uh, to both of our panelists for being with us this afternoon. Um, let me kind of switch the conversation um, and offer both of you an opportunity to share with us um, some of the best practices and, and what we should be looking for um, in terms of making elections open and fair and convenient for all the constituents that have to vote. So if you had the the wherewithal to make changes, what are some of the best practices and things that you think we ought to do? Um, thank you so much, Commissioner Hill. Um, so I think um, recent proposals in federal voting rights legislation that unfortunately did not pass offered um, some be best practices that um, really, really sort of looked at the states writ large and tried to figure out what was working for voters. So, for example, um, among the uh, various provisions, and one I like in particular is uh, making Election Day a holiday so that people um, who, um, you know, who are working can take that time off. Another provision that makes sense to me is automatic voter registration, right, which some states have, but uh, it would be a really nice feature if all states had that. Um, other best practices, just, you know, more generally, uh, independent, independent commissions for drawing um, uh, congressional districts was one of the proposals that made a lot of sense and would advance um, the interests of voters. Because after all, the right to vote is, is incredibly important. It's more important than, you know, going to McDonald's or Home Depot or any number of places where um, people also exercise choice, right? This is about electing our, our leaders. And so... I do think that this, it is important to facilitate opportunities for voters to cast those ballots. This is why, for example, if you care about election security, drop boxes make an awful lot of sense, right? Because it is going directly to the supervisor of elections. Um, so you don't have to, it doesn't matter who the postmaster general is and whether or not your, your ballot gets delivered in a timely manner. Instead, you can use a drop box and you know that your, your vote um, uh, we'll go straight to the supervisor of elections. So there just uh, there are a number of proposals that you know could facilitate participation. I understand that every state is different and every proposal won't work, um, but there are certain things that have are that clearly work in making sure that people are able to participate. Um, drop boxes, which we've you know been talking about extensively, is one way of increasing participation. Um, so I'll stop there and, and leave it to Mr. Scott to fill in the rest. Thank you. Thank you. So, so one I actually mentioned earlier was the idea that, you know, we should allow there to be a postmark date. You know, I find that that is something that confuses a lot of voters. And if you think about, you know, the other 
another thing that people do every single year is taxes, right? And people know that they can mail their taxes on that due date, and if it's postmarked that day, they're okay. Um, and people feel like elections work the same way. Um, and in a lot of ways, if we know that they mailed their ballot on election day, it's not as if they somehow change their their vote based on you know the results because they didn't have that option. Um, so it would just make sense that would be something that you know allowing ballots to be counted if they're postmarked before election day or on election day. Um, that would be an easy one. Um, I also believe that we need to allow for voter registration and for people to change uh, their party preferences um, much, much closer, possibly even on election day um, would be uh, very helpful, especially in a state like Florida that is a closed primary state. Um, sometimes we end up with what could be a, and we actually see this a lot, are what could be a um, clerical error, uh, especially at our, um, our driver's license agency here in Florida. Clerical error could cause somebody's party affiliation to change to NPA. Um, if they go and update their driver's license and they don't check their party box and they eventually default to no party affiliation. And then when they go to vote in a primary election, there becomes a problem because the book closing or our voter registration deadline is 29 days before, and we don't allow people to make um, that party affiliation change um, within that 29 day window. Um, so having it so that we can update registrations uh, far closer to election day and even on election day, as well as allowing postmark deadlines would be tremendous um, improvements to our system. Thank you. Oh, can see, but um, and wait for the next. One. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll move next to Linda Kidwell. Ms. Kidwell, please go ahead. Hi there. Um, so I, I'll say up front, I'm not particularly keen on imputing motives to people um, without at least uh, discussing motives in both directions, such as concerns about. Um, you know, how our right to vote is just as critically impacted by people who are ineligible voting as it is by blocking people who are eligible from voting. Both of those represent a denial of our right to vote. So I think um, we need to to be mindful of the of some of the, let's say, non-discriminatory nature of, of at least some of the push toward tightening up voting procedures. Um, but the, the question that I have is, um, is for our commissioner here. Um, the so so I'll preface it by saying I'm an accounting professor, and I one of the major areas that I teach is about internal controls, um, and it's it's a common truth that places like you know Walmart or a convenience store or whatever that have um, cameras focused 24/7. Nobody's actually watching those, and it's only if a crime takes place that somebody goes to watch that. But I think it, it um, so if we were to go from having it have to be in, um, you know, in one of your designated offices to go to um, drop boxes as long as they were under camera surveillance, who's watching all of that tape, those 24 hours worth of tape? How is that being monitored so that? That is an effective control that makes it a suitable replacement for having to vote um, at a location specifically. Uh, so, you know, my, my feelings on that are more or less irrelevant because we're going to comply with the law. Um, but what, when we did have it under video surveillance, there simply weren't any problems. So the video surveillance, we did have a security guard monitoring and you could monitor multiple boxes at the same time on video. So whereas you might have one person at the, at the time, there were only two. So we have one person monitoring two boxes um, as opposed to now having two people at every box. Uh, so we have more boxes and now we have people at each of those boxes. Um, in terms of that being some sort of a um, security measure, if somebody wanted to um, do something to those boxes, um, we're not and we're not expected to hire people who are necessarily going to violently confront somebody who wanted to do damage to our drop boxes. 
Um, so since we don't have those type of people there, it's very unlikely that in the event that somebody wanted to um, to do something, um, wanted to um, attack our drop boxes somehow, or, um, you know, if something like that were to happen, the people that we have there are not um, are not there to to resist that kind of an effort. If they were to do that, um, so so that's the problem. So we we're paying people to be there, but in terms of being concerned that somebody's going to damage our drop boxes. Which is, by the way, never happened. It's never happened. Um, it just doesn't seem as if that's, um, you know, as if it's solving that problem. So, then so you're saying they were content. monitored in person, not just by camera? Right. So it doesn't seem as if having people there in person solves any problem other than causing us to um, to use more of our resources on elections. To me, that it seems as if it's just not a very efficient way to to have um to have a dropbox and, and being very specific too because in some cases um you know like the basically the two locations that we had the drop boxes at even though we didn't have a person sitting next to the drop box there was physical security on the property but even now that physical the physical security that we have the security guards that are there um to um to monitor the building um are not sufficient to monitor the drop boxes so it's not as if there wasn't multiple layers of security. Um, one of the Dropbox locations, it was in a, a lobby um, of our government center, and there's a desk there with a security guard. But the uh, law is very specific that they have to be employees of the supervisor of elections. So the supervisor okay, thank of you elections for has to provide uh, people to sit right by the Dropbox. So it's like when you really drill down into the law and how they wrote it and the way that they set it up, they made it so specific that it's like, if you want to have these drop boxes, you're going to have to spend some money. You're going to have to use your resources. You're going to have to ask for a budget increase um, in order to do it. You know, they were very, very specific in the way it was written um, to make us use more resources. And, and that's where um, trying to decide what was the, um, what was really motivating this change. Um, when you look at what's really motivating the change, it seems pretty clear that they're trying to make it um, make it so that if you want to have these drop boxes, you have to spend more money. It's almost like a punishment on us for each drop box that we have. Think of it like a fine for a fine for every drop box. Um, that's that's more or less what it is. Okay. Thank you. I have a question for the dean, but I'll wait till my the second round. Great. Thank you so much. We'll go ahead and move to committee member Michael Morley. Mr. Morley, please go ahead. Great, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank both of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us today. Dean Tolson, your scholarship in this field has been pathbreaking, so we definitely benefited from, from uh, getting, getting to hear your remarks. I would wanted to ask you, do you think that Congress has the authority to deal with the issues that you've identified and how, particularly since we're talking about different types of elections, and what do you think is the best way of thinking about the different grants of, of power that the Constitution might, might grant Congress over this? Uh, Su Supervisor Scott, thank you very much for your service. I'm here in Orange County, so I, I have Supervisor Cowles, who do, does, does a phenomenal job here. And I had wanted to ask you about the drop boxes. There were two incidents that I had read about uh, in other states, one, one, from, uh, one from Boston and one from California in the 2020 election, where the drop boxes were set on fire and the different estimates of numbers of ballots were, were destroyed. Is there anything about ours that are like more fireproof or that have precautions against that sort of arson or you know, to, to prevent people from you know, targeting particular groups of voters by by uh, you know, going after collections of, of the ballots and drop boxes like that? So our boxes are built. One is that we're, we're built into the building. Um, and I know you asked us both a question, so I'll be very brief and pass it to the professor. Um, so our some of them built into the building. Now our boxes since SB90 are now metal boxes that are mobile that are on wheels. And then we put them away at the end of the shift. So we can only have the ballots out during the time that they're that we have employees to staff it during specific hours, and then we take it away. So we don't have the 24-hour drop boxes like we had before since SB90. But you know, as far as being fire resistant, I think we've done a little bit to make it fire resistant. Yeah. 
Um, thank you so much, Professor Morley, for that question. Um, so, so it, congressional power in this area largely depends on whether or not um, the power impacts voter qualification standards or the time, places, and manner of federal elections. So states have substantial authority when it comes to setting voter qualification standards, which um, in, in your research, let's be clear, touches on this uh, in very important ways um, in sort of thinking through um, congressional power over voter qualification standards and how uh, Congress's power is broad if it implicates, for, for example, racial discrimination in voting, um, the right to vote more generally under the 14th Amendment, uh, gender under the 19th Amendment, um, age under the 26th Amendment, and so on, right? So there are specific grants of authority in the uh, federal constitution that gives Congress power to intrude on voter qualification standards if a state has done something pernicious. Um, but, but generally speaking, when it comes to the time, places, and manner of federal elections, uh, congressional power is substantially broader because Congress can intervene without necessarily having to look for some prohibited reason. Um, so, for example, with respect to drop boxes and, and, and vote by mail restrictions, Congress, Congress could conceivably um, uh, regulate with respect to federal elections. Now, of course, this becomes very burdensome for states in some, in some ways because they have to run a two-tier system if they disagree with um, the way Congress has um, uh, used this power. Um, but um, that's just how the Constitution is set up, right? When it comes to federal elections and, and, and sort of election administration, Congress's authority, um, the Supreme Court has referred to it as being paramount over state authority. Uh, voter qualification standards is much trickier. Congress has to uh, have a specific textual hook that allows it to intrude with respect to voter qualifications. Thank you so much. Um, I can, we're going to return for another. Um, we're going to have question opportunity for panelists uh, for committee members to ask additional questions. Just wanted to provide uh, a thank you again as well for our speakers today for being with us. We appreciate your experience and expertise and just want to um, remind committee members and members of the public at large will open up at the end, but we are. We just want to encourage everyone to be respectful in your questioning and allow folks opportunity to respond fully and um, keep our questions focused on the committee's understanding of recent legislative, um, not legislative, I'm sorry, the recent um, judicial ruling regarding SB 90 and making sure that committee members walk away from this meeting today with a better understanding of that and how it impacts your current project. Um, with that, I'll go back to the top of the list. If there are follow up questions from committee members, we'll open it up um, for committee members to ask another question. We do have time left to go through um, one more time. So we'll, we'll start again at the top of the list uh, with Warren Belmar. Mr. Belmar, would you like to ask another question? Please go yes, ahead. I would, but I'd also like to thank our witnesses for their testimony and for their taking the time and participate. I too. Uh, have been impressed with their commitment that we share for making sure that everyone has an opportunity to cast a ballot. And that is what we're all working for. Uh, this question goes to, uh, to both again, and we've in the uh, earlier comment by Dean Tolson, uh, we had a reference to uh, three types of suppression of votes and, uh, one was eliminating opportunities to vote early. Uh, another had to do with voting devices. And the third one was purging voter rolls. Uh, my question to both of you is what constitutes purging voter rolls as opposed to maintaining the integrity of voting rolls? Well, what conduct uh, does Broward County engage in that constitutes purging as opposed to uh, voter roll integrity and what are examples of purging that, uh, which is a, you know, a word that carries a certain flavor to it, uh, that, that are being, uh, that you have examples of in the state of Florida. 
Um, so I'll, I'll speak more broadly and then Mr. Scott can come in and speak about Broward County specifically if he chooses. Um, but when, when I use the, the, the term voter purge, um, I want to be clear that I don't see anything wrong with states maintaining their voter list so that they're accurate, right? So um, doing some, you know, lawful audits is, is perfectly okay. I'm speaking more to when they, the algorithm is so flawed and, and so um, um, overbroad that it captures uh, a disproportionate amount of individuals who are legally entitled to vote. Um, because then it, it raises, uh, it increases burdens on those individuals in order to show that they are supposed to be on the voter rolls or they get purged and they have to re-register, right? So it's not that the, and I know, and I agree with you, Commissioner Belmer, that the terms, it, it has negative connotations, but there's nothing wrong with um, states or, you know, individual supervisors coming in and making sure that there aren't people on the rolls who are not supposed to be there. But I just think we have to be careful about how that process is undertaken. And in fact, a lot of litigation centers around um, not the process itself, right? Not the fact that states are ensuring that their voter rolls are accurate, but more so about the process used to make sure that that determination is made in a way that to, that doesn't exclude too many lawful voters. What is the process that uh, you would recommend as opposed to the process, I don't know what the algorithm is, but, uh, or I didn't understand that, but, you know, what is the problem with the process today and how would you suggest that we recommend it be corrected? Well, I, you know, parts of that question are probably more appropriate for uh, the supervisor who actually engages in this. But one of the things that stood out to me is um, during the election of 2000, for example, um, the, a lot of voters were pur purged who had names similar to, uh, individuals with convicted fel who were, uh, convicted felons. Right? And so the, the algorithm algorithm was overbroad in order to capture those individuals. And it resulted in a large amount of people of color being purged from the list erroneously. Right? So th there's just instances in which, um, you know, they they states engage in this, in this name match and the names don't exactly match. You end up capturing people who, um, are otherwise entitled to vote, but. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, process Broward County uses, but I'll turn it over to Mr. Scott so that he can comment further. So, you know, I think one part that gets missed in this conversation is that if you're, you know, if you're a U.S. citizen over the age of 18 and a resident of the state of Florida, you have a right to vote. Um, however, if you meet all those qualifications and you don't register within 29 days, um, you are not going to be able to vote in an election. Um, and if we, um, if we were to, you know, one thing is that we use this, um, we have this mental model of the voter rolls, which isn't exactly a real thing. So we have a, you know, a voter registration system in the state of Florida in which once you go in, you never fully come out of there. So what happens, uh, you know, in a real practical sense is that people are either an active voter, an inactive voter, or an ineligible voter. And, you know, we, we, we face a lot of criticism from both sides where people will talk about purging, which I, I really don't like that term um, because that, again, it doesn't happen, you know, but nobody gets removed um, ever. Um, and, and I especially like to say that when I'm speaking with uh, more conservative crowds, just to get a little shock effect in the room, but we don't remove anybody from the voter rolls. Um, Except dead people, I hope. No. No, and let me explain why. Um, uh, the professor actually touched on this a little bit as well. Um, what if um, we remove you and, uh, and uh, not not to make this you know personal to anybody, but to say an individual, let's say an individual passes away and it's, they have a very common name. Um, you've got you know clerical administrative people that are then working here, and especially in the state of Florida where you have this. Um, book closing deadline that we have 29 days before an election. If we do make somebody ineligible to vote, um, they will not be able to vote um, uh, if they were to show up. So if the person were to show up, and if you're inactive, if you're inactive, you can show up at your polling place with your ID in hand and reactivate yourself if you're inactive. And then sometimes people will say, oh, they're still on the voter rolls. Well, sort of. Um, and, you know, for again, that's a, a mental construct that we have called the voter rolls that isn't exactly aligned with reality. Um, but yes, a person that we thought was dead shows up at a polling place with an ID in hand. We now have determined that they are not dead. 
and they are very much alive and they are allowed to vote. All right. So if we make the action so permanent that that person cannot vote, what do we do if it turns out to be a clerical error? And again, you know, we use dead people as an example, but another great example is somebody convicted of a felony or somebody who was adjudicated as uh, mentally um, in ineligible. You know, sometimes um, these actions can be reversed. Um, and we can be left with few options um, other than disenfranchising the voter. So I think the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that it's a complicated system. And the, the criticism we face is that the system gets oversimplified um, when anybody says there are dead people on the voter rolls. That's just simply nonsense. Um, and it's hard to and it's hard to counter those things sometimes because it's so easy to make a simple statement like that that is just wildly inaccurate. Um, and uh, it's hard for us as administrators to kind of give the more complicated and nuanced explanation of how the system really works. Have you had examples in Broward County of people who are presumed to have deceased who have shown up and were denied the right to vote? Not, I mean, they wouldn't be denied the right to vote because of the way the system works. They would be moved to the, they would, their, 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 um, their status would be changed to inactive. And by the way, these, these types of things. So the other one is people who moved away. Okay. So these types of things do happen. Fairly regularly, um, you know, I can't necessarily give you a number or anything like that, but yes, um, people have commonly have the same name. And they will show up, and sometimes another thing that happens characterized is characterized as dead. Huh? I was referring to you know since we use dead people as an example, uh, has that situation been prominent, and has it been uh, occurring as a result of any discriminatory practice? For example, I, I served for many many elections all over different communities in Palm Beach County. And in all of the years I've done that, I've never seen an individual turned away and be unable to vote because of an inability to produce a picture ID. But I hear a lot of concern about that. And you know, is that a problem uh, in Broward County? Are, are there examples of that where people are being turned well, away? So here's the thing. It's about like uh, proving something that didn't, there's not necessarily any documentation of something like that happening. So if somebody were to show up, you show up to the polling place, there's this signage out there. And then there's people who, you know, are letting you know, hey, do you have your ID? And then they're like, ah, ah, ah. And then they maybe, oh, let me go see if I have it in the car. And then they get in the car and they drive away. You know, there's no documentation. I, I, I think it's a virtual certainty that people show up to the polling place without their ID and, and are turned away. I mean, that happens. I mean, to say that never happens, it's, you know, people, people show, are going to show up without their ID. Of course, they. Well, I think in the last hearing we had, there was an example of someone who had requested an absentee ballot and it turned out that you didn't have the right information. It wasn't an example of someone who was listed on the rolls as dead or having moved, but just uh, someone who uh, hadn't filled out the proper, complete uh, information. And right. we were so, told that all it took in that instance was to correct the missing information. And you're, you're, right. I'm just trying to balance out your responsibilities for making things available and the problems that we're identifying in some of the testimony. I'd love to have some examples of to figure out just how widespread it is rather than uh, assuming that, you know, People who moved are going to show up in the ballot in the same area or be thought to have moved or thought to have died. And if they show up, you can still accommodate them. Or if they try to vote early or they try to vote by mail, uh, there's still an opportunity to correct it before election day so that they can show up on election day. 
So uh, I'm and just we'll allow panelists, to... we'll allow speakers to go ahead and respond to that. And then um, if we have time again, after all committee members have had an opportunity for a second question, we can return for additional follow up. Thank you. Um, sure. Um, okay, so. I guess I'm sorry. So I, I, I lost a loss. Could you give me just real briefly what it was again? <laughs> I was just wondering, and Dean Tolson, you've done so much study in the area as well. Are there examples that, uh, you know, have created problems for people who are not deceased trying to vote that have been stopped or uh, uh, other examples? Again, we're coming down to what constitutes purging uh, so as to make it hard for people who should be allowed to vote to vote. Absolutely. Oh, sorry. So, Mr. Scott, go ahead, please. Okay, the vote by mail list. So specifically on that, so it's you're talking about the identifiers from SB90. So after SB90 passed, we actually had 73,000 people um, on our on our voter rolls who did not have one of those identifiers. The identifiers being either a driver's license number, state ID number, or the last four of their social security number. So you know, so there were a lot of people who potentially, yes, they could just update that information. But let's say they put in their request at the last minute, which we do have a lot of people who wait until the deadline. So it's the deadline and they go and request a vote by mail ballot and they don't have the identifiers. They will, uh, in that circumstance, a person would be prevented, you know, just sort of by those hard deadlines um, from being able to participate because of that. So, yes, would I mean, you able to reach out to those. If you had that many people, were you able to reach out to them to ask them to update the missing information? We, we sent a letter and we got about a 10% response on the, uh, on the letter we sent out. Thank you so much and we'll go ahead and move on to our next um, committee member for a 2nd question. Um, Bradford Brown, Mr. Brown, would you like to ask any further questions? Oh, thank you. Okay, great. Um, we'll move on then. Um, Thomas Newcomb Hyde, Mr. Hyde, would you like to ask a question? I don't have a question at this time. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Charlene Taylor Hill, um, Ms. Taylor Hill, do you have any additional questions? Yeah, I think you're on mute. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thought I'd taken myself off. I do have a question um, for Mr. Scott, and it goes back to an earlier question around the the shortening of the time to request um, a vote by mail ballot. Um, there was some numbers thrown out that it was over a thousand plus days under the. Uh, previously, and now under the new law, it's a, a shorter time. What are some of the challenges um, around doing that? You sort of talked about or alluded to budgeting, but could you speak more about what, what the challenges are to supervisors of election throughout Florida with that shortening of the time? Sure. Um, so that was a unique uh, perspective on the situation. Um, uh, of putting it the way that um, the commissioner put, put it when he said that. Um, so basically what has happened is that we now have to request a vote by mail ballot every cycle. So your request is good for the entire election cycle. And whereas you could potentially have a policy where somebody is registered to vote by mail and they continuously get vote by mail ballots as long as they are a regular voter, as long as they are, you know, as long as we don't get some kind of kickback or some kind of cancellation, it just continues. If we have to re-register, basically re-register, imagine if we had to re-register people every single cycle. That's more or less what we're being required to do here on the vote by mail side of it. We have to re-register them every election cycle. So there's an administrative element to that. A uh, phone call, a letter that we have to read and act on. Um, you know, an email that we're going to get or just a request through our website that then requires 
um, you know, some data entry. So there's there is an administrative task that has to be done for every single voter to request a vote by mail ballot again. And the question being is what is what makes it necessary for us to do this more often than we had to do it before? Um, you know, or you know, why wouldn't we move in the other direction instead of every four years? Why not let it go eight years or or just let it go indefinitely? Um, as long as the person is continuing to to use it and it continues to live at the same address. Thank you. All right. Um, we'll move next to Linda Kidwell. Ms. Kidwell, would you like to ask yeah, any additional question, questions? My question now is for Dean Paulson. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to step back to a more holistic question. Um, when this committee developed our program, um, that law had recently been passed and we wanted to investigate its potential impact. Just before our prior hearing, um, it was blocked by the court. Um, and one of the reasons that um, we asked you to come talk to us was to help us understand the nature of um, why it was um, why it was blocked by the court. And so I wanted to ask if you would please explain to us what the, um, you know, and the ruling was like 280 pages <laughs> most of us on this committee aren't lawyers, or at least half of us aren't. Um, so if you could um, sort of summarize for us, what was the judge's reasoning for that ruling? And also um, given that there are two sides to this case, um, what are the likely, um, you know, even if you don't agree with them, what are the likely um, arguments to be made on appeal for why that decision should be reversed? Can you help us as a, as a legal expert on both sides of that question, please? Uh, yes. So, um, Judge Walker's opinion um, uh, basically enjoined three provisions of SB 90. So, the drop box restrictions, um, some of the restrictions on third party uh, voter registration, um, organizations and, and, and really the, the registration disclaimer, right? So the, under the law, these individuals in registering voters were required to make certain disclaimers, right? Like this, um, your application might not get to the division of elections within 14 days. You know that you can turn this in yourself, you know, we, you don't have to use us and so on. So um, that, the, the, um, Judge Walker found that that was a violation of the First Amendment because it compels speech that the speaker didn't necessarily agree with. Um, and also uh, what was called the, the line warming ban. Um, so there was a prohibition on um, of, of anyone engaging in any activity that uh, had the intent to influence voters, right? And so the, the understanding is that this would discourage individuals from approaching people waiting in line uh, who might, you know, they may give them food or water and, you know, for fear of committing a crime, they wouldn't do that. Um, and in part, you know, all of this is connected, right? So the restrictions on early voting led to more election day turnout, you get longer lines. And so um, one way to help voters waiting in long lines is to give them food and water. So uh, the, the line warming ban essentially made it difficult to do that. Um, so uh, this of course will be appealed uh, because uh, among the provisions that um, the Judge Walker relied on are uh, the Voting Rights Act and the 14th and 15th Amendments. And the Supreme Court in particular has taken a more narrow view of those provisions in recent years. Um, so, for example, um, in a recent case called Bronovich, the Supreme Court uh, interpreted Section 2 very narrowly. And, what, and, and for our purposes, understanding that decision pretty much establishes that as long as states provide um, election day voting, Right, like, uh, then they have some flexibility in, um, in, in what they do outside of that. And, and in particularly thinking about uh, constricting opportunities outside of election day voting um, and the, the effect on voters of color, right? The court is also clear that the effect on voters, of, uh, uh, on voters of color also has to be relatively substantial. It can't be minor. Um, and, and so uh, I think most court watchers think that Judge Walker's opinion probably won't be upheld on appeal because the court has really narrowed um, these, um, the, the analysis under these, these various provisions. Um, and then also when we talk about questions of intent, 
um, the court is is does not like to ascribe discriminatory intent to uh, state legislatures, and so that also uh, makes it very difficult to establish violations of the Fifteenth Amendment in particular. So, um, the the opinion is lengthy, as you mentioned, two hundred eighty eight pages. He tries to kind of cover every base. He goes through a lot of the history that I talked about. You know, he talks about it in the opinion in order to show that um, these voting restrictions are, you know, have built on sort of prior practices and are longstanding. But I think on appeal, it would be very difficult for the opinion to be upheld, given the, the, the state of current voting rights jurisprudence. And it was only those three provisions that were mm -hmm. blocked by Judge Walker? Mm -hmm. The requirement that the boxes be manned at all times, the pro uh, provision against um, bringing people water, and what was the third one, I'm sorry? Uh, the line warming ban, the registration disclaimer uh, for third party oh, right, voting right. organizations. Mm -hmm. And and Judge Walker upheld the rest of it and just enjoyed yes. those three parts. Yeah. So the, the challenge to the vote by mail was upheld. I mean, I'm sorry, it was okay. it was not sustained. Okay, thank you for um, for the clarification and explanation. Really appreciate it. Sure. Um, and um, Mr. Morley, Michael Morley, if we have any additional questions. Great, thank you. Dean Tolson, we've heard a lot about the racially uh, disparate impact of many of the voting restrictions that the legislature had adopted, some of several of which Judge Walker struck down. Could you explain the links between that disparate impact and historical discrimination, the ongoing effects of systemic discrimination and 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 tie that together, and explain you know how that implicates the the, the Voting Rights Act. Uh, Supervisor Scott, I was I was hoping to get your thoughts. One of the big issues with regard to absentee ballots is how verifying that they're that either the ballot or the request is coming from the person who it's purporting to come from. Based on your experience, do you have any thoughts as to what the best way, uh, if any, of, of verifying that is, whether it's signature match, whether it's using some sort of identification number, whether there whether there's some other way that would give you as a supervisor, you know, confidence that yes, this is the right voter without you know substantially burdening people or having disparate impacts against members of or historically marginalized communities? Commissioner Morley, thank you so much for that question. And so I, I do think that there's a connection between restrictions we see now and restrictions that we've that we've seen historically in terms of discriminatory effect. Um, in the 1890s, uh, Florida, as well as a, a number of, of Southern states, in fact, passed voting restrictions that were facially race neutral because they were trying to um, steer clear of federal oversight that might be triggered had they passed restrictions that uh, blatantly violated the 15th Amendment, right? It's important to understand that that was a different time, right? So we didn't really think about things in terms of discriminatory intent. Instead, um, the way the court conceived it is, is, is if it was facially discriminatory, it violated the 15th Amendment. Um, if not, then it was fine, um, at least as how state legislatures understood uh, their constitutional obligations. And so starting with Mississippi in 1890s, you had a series of states change their state constitutions to embrace more facially race neutral voting restrictions that specifically targeted um, uh, black and brown voters. Um, and so, so the interesting thing is that a lot of the targeting uh, was based on uh, voting methods. It was based on uh, geography, right? So, um, uh, minorities were concentrated in a lot of urban areas. Now, of course, they lived in rural areas as well, but um, they were concentrated in a lot of uh, urban areas in these states. And so it became um, easy for certain state legislatures to um, identify practices that would target, you know, cities with 10,000 or more people and, you know, things of that nature to get at these at these uh, particular voters. And so what you see now is uh, something very similar in the sense that the state legislature is trying to target minority voters to face facially race neutral laws uh, through their voting methods. This is why SB 90 focuses on vote by mail, because um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, black voters in particular experienced a 100 percent increase in their use of vote by mail in, in Florida in a six year period. And so um, that way, one of the reasons the targeting becomes important. Um, is because the goal is not to harm voters who are who vote favorably to the part with with the party, um, and, and instead you want to try to isolate those voters who tend to have a, a different uh, a voting pattern. 
Um, and, and so there, there are a lot of parallels between what Florida and other states did in the 1890s and what's going on now. This is why I make the point that it's not always about discriminatory intent, right? Sometimes it's just about identifying particular voting patterns and using that as a basis of regulations with hopes that it will disenfranchise the individuals that um, you hope it will. Um, but you don't necessarily have to say, hey, I want to disenfranchise Black people, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a way of bypassing all of that, but it still has the same effect. Uh, luckily, since 1982, the Section 2 of the, the Voting Rights Act does not require a showing of discriminatory intent. Um, effect is enough to violate uh, the terms of that provision. And that remains true, even if Judge Walker's opinion is overturned on appeal. Um, that is the, the, the really the distinction between the statutory regime and the constitutional one, which does, for facially neutral laws, require evidence of discriminatory intent in some cases. Uh, so. So on this, the signature matching piece is what we use today and what I really hope Florida continues to use in the future when it comes to verifying that our vote by mail ballots are in fact coming from the voters who, who, um, who they're supposed to be coming from. So the way that our system works is that we actually, um, when we receive the ballots, the first thing that happens is they go into a machine called a sorter. Now that sorter actually has a digital camera that captures an image of the voter signature and it also also scans a barcode that's on the envelope. So then that um, envelope is then matched to the voter file and an employee who's sitting at a workstation with a computer can then see the signature that we have on file, um, which is most often in the state of Florida, it's the signature that's on your driver's license. Um, and then that signature is then matched to the signature that's on the envelope. If the signature does not match, that envelope is never opened. Um, it's not until the second pass through the sorter that we actually, after we have separated out all of the, the, the second pass through the sorter separates out the ballots that failed signature match, and then the other ballots go forward as far as being slid open, and then the ballots are removed from the envelopes. So if the signature does not match, that ballot is never opened, the, uh, unless the voter actually cures the ballot. Um, so the solid, the, 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 um, system that we have in place is pretty solid in terms of making sure that it is the same person who voted that ballot, um, who, who requested the ballot, um, is the one who voted the ballot. Um, and, and if we were to go even further um, in terms of what um, Texas has already put in place in terms of adding an, an additional envelope, um, what they've done is now they have a, there's a voter certificate, the certificate that they sign. Um, now has a space to put your driver's license number or the last four of your social. Um, one problem that we have that we've already experienced with our vote by mail requests is that they, um, A, it has to match what we have on file. That's one. And um, in some cases, we may not have either of those identifiers on file. Now, after this 2022 election, because of SB 90, you won't have voters in the future who can receive a vote by mail ballot without those identifiers. Um, that'll start in the next cycle, in the 2024 cycle. But the problem could become is that you just create a, a surge of, of potential cure issues. Um, where now you're asking people, people may not fill it out properly. And if they don't fill it out properly, you know, there could be some confusion over what we do with those. Um, so it's another thing that could potentially greatly increase the cost of elections um, and just make things more difficult and probably would disenfranchise many, many people. Because another thing is when you add that extra requirement to cure the ballot is that most people just don't. Um, we reach out and we try to contact them and we try to get them to, but they're busy, maybe it's too late. Um, they have until two days after the election to cure their ballot. And if they're busy, if they're working, if they can't get over there to take care of it, um, then their vote ends up not counting and they end up becoming disenfranchised. Um, so I'm very concerned about the, the, the movement in Florida to, um, to include the driver's license number or the last four of the social on the actual vote by mail envelope itself. And I firmly believe that the signature match um, that we use today is, is more than sufficient and, and works very well. Thank you so much. We really appreciate everyone's participation at this time. Um, we have reached the end of our committee 
question and answer period. Um, we appreciate all of our speakers and our committee members for being here today and engaging in such a productive conversation. Um, at this time, panelists may leave the session if you wish, or you're welcome to stay on for public comment, and we will open the meeting to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to offer comments to the committee about the topic in order to allow us time to hear from multiple members of the public. If there are those who wish to speak, um, we ask you to keep your comments limited to two to four minutes each. As a reminder, all remarks are recorded for the public record. And as the moderator of this discussion, I reserve the privilege to sh cut short any statements that might defame, degrade, or not pertain to the issue at hand. I will now invite members of the public to share a brief statement with the committee. If you would like to pl speak, please raise your hand by selecting your name in WebEx or selecting star three if you have joined us by phone. And I will call on you within the order that I see your hands. <clears throat> If you are unable to share testimony live during today's briefing due to time limitations or accessibility issues, please reach out to Liliana Schiller at L-S-C-H-I-L-L-E-R at USCCR.gov to follow up within the next 30 days. Again, that is L-S-C-H-I-L-L-E-R at USCCR.gov and her address is on the screen right now. Information on how to follow up will be included on the final slide in today's presentation, which you see in front of you now. <clears throat> so I'll pause for just a minute to see if there are any members of the public who would like to queue at this time. While we're waiting. I, oh, sorry, go ahead. I heard a member speaking. Oh, okay, and I do not see any members of the public signaling at this time. <clears throat> okay. Are there any final comments from committee members? I'd like to comment. Okay, please go ahead. Do I have to do anything to speak? Can you hear me? No, nope, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Is, is David still with us or is he gone? Uh, David has stepped away. All right. I was a little disappointed. I, 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 last time we got together, Michael Morley had lined up uh, some uh, objective speakers who would give us the analysis of SB90, plus or in favor or against. But instead, this time we got uh, Dean uh, Colson and uh, Su Su Supervisor Scott, who are clearly advocates against this particular uh, legislation, rather than giving the uh, Florida committee uh, an opportunity to give a fair evaluation of what we, what is the objective view of SB 80. Anybody care to comment on that? And this, uh, we did have committee members. I, I wasn't part of all of the planning meetings, but I know the committee members discussed and we reached out to panelists who committee members had asked. We did have a number of folks who we reached out to who were not able to join us today. And we can certainly follow up during the next committee business meeting to discuss if there are other voices and perspectives that you feel are not represented that we can um, include them in future meetings. So, um, and I would, given that we don't have our chair with us today and um, I, I would like to suggest saving that uh, and and having enough discussion, enough time for the entire committee to contribute um, to a ro more robust discussion. I would like to propose um, saving that for the next business meeting so that members can um, discuss more thoroughly. I, I, am I allowed to talk now or not? Uh, yes, please go ahead. I'm aware of that, but uh, for example, uh, Dean Tolson kept talking about 1890 and poll tax and, and not only the sins of our fathers, these were the sins of our grandfathers and our great grandfathers. Okay, I'm sorry they were sinful, but we've got to start talking about what happens in 2022. And I don't think we're there. Why, why, why are we doing this? We're talking about something that happened 130 years ago? Come on. Okay. All right. And and thank you for that. We appreciate um, committee members. Sorry. 
Carol. sharing. And are there any other um, final comments or questions? Not uh, questions at this time. I think our a lot of our panelists have uh, needed needed to go at this time, and we don't have members of the public. Any final comments from committee members just about the process or or next steps? Um, we will. Excuse again... me, Melissa. Can I come in as a member of the public? Ah, uh, yes. Please go ahead. Um, so I just want to um, uh, sort of emphasize the importance of understanding the past, because I do think that one of the things I tried to bring out in my testimony um, is the fact that what happened in the 1890s is directly relevant because the Florida legislature today is relying on the same tactics as the Florida legislature of the 1890s. So in order to forgive the sins of our grandfathers, we have to stop embracing their methods. Um, and so this is why I wanted to talk about both time periods in order to show that there's a trajectory here. Um, and the fact that we haven't really put to rest the past, I would love to stop talking about it. Uh, but in order to do that, we have to embrace the idea that people should be able to vote and that if America is going to hold itself out as a democracy, um, then that with that comes certain obligations. And we, meaning various states, are not upholding that obligation to their citizens. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, have our final remarks. We appreciate everyone's participation in today's meeting. If you have joined um, to provide public comment, but we did not hear from you, we ask you to please email your remarks to Liliana at the email address that's on your screen um, <clears throat> within 30 days, which is May 29th, 2022. This information is available on the on the slide in front of you. I'd like to thank all of our speakers and members of the public um, and members of the committee for sharing with us today. We are very much appreciative of your time. We'll keep your comments in mind as we draft our report and information on upcoming meetings will be available in the Federal Register. Um, and we will adjourn for today's meeting and I will follow up with committee members uh, after discussing with your chair how we can go ahead and schedule your next business meeting for for committee to regroup and look at the testimony we've received so far and consider next steps in your study. Thank you very much. Today's meeting is adjourned.